Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're digging right in today for talking a little bit about um, what to be thinking about when you're looking at purchasing seeds, um, but also um, some tricks to try and find um, seeds and where to purchase them from. So let's dig in. So normally December is the kind of time of year when a lot of gardeners, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, that's when our seed catalogs are starting to show up. They're coming through the door, they're arriving in our mailboxes, even in our inbox if we've signed up um, for email notifications. And it's a really good time if you're in the Northern Hemisphere because, you know, there's not a lot growing for a lot of us. Um, You know, frosts are here, snow is here for a lot of people. I've got family in Alaska and there's so much snow up there. Um, And, you know, they are, you know, a good time for us to kind of sit down, you know, grab a cup of coffee, a nice cup of tea, and just kind of, you know, reflect back on how our garden grew last year. If this is going to be your first year gardening, um, then, you know, kind of take stock of what are the types of vegetables and things that you really like to grow. And even if, you know, we grew um, a garden last year, you know, it's a good question to always go back and and think about. Is this something that you want to grow again? You know, did you really like this particular variety? Um, if if you're a new gardener, then, you know, what varieties um, are you typically buying? Do you know? Um, if you're getting things from a farmer's market, then you might know um, a little bit more about the type types of vegetables that you are growing in the varieties that you are eating um, and purchasing because farmers like really do like to talk about um, the varieties that they're growing and um, you know what what it is that you're purchasing um, but as a, as a new gardener it can be really easy to um, you know just kind of cave into all those pretty pictures of the different vegetable varieties and um, buy everything. Um, which will be a very expensive enterprise indeed. Um, But one of the good tips to do before those catalogs start coming through, or even if you've got them already, is just to kind of sit down and write down the sort of um, vegetables or herbs and fruits, things that you are eating regularly or purchasing regularly. So for example, like I eat a lot of things like Florence fennel, tomatoes, tomatoes, basil like I really like kind of Italian um, and Greek kind of cuisines very Mediterranean cuisine Um, it's definitely my favorite so I try to craft um, my garden and seed list plans based on foods that I really like to eat so I know that I eat fennel for example um, at least two bulbs a week so I would want to be looking at purchasing fennel seed um that's going to see me through growing enough um, so I can stop purchasing it from the grocery store as an example. So I'll create a list of all the fruits and veggies that I eat and my family eats and I just kind of tally up like how often we'll eat that particular thing or how often um, I'm buying it from the grocery store for example. So you might only eat green beans at Thanksgiving, um, but you might want to say, you know what, next year I really want to grow my own green beans to do my own green bean casserole. Well, if you're only purchasing it once a year, um, then you're only going to need a few plants to grow um, and make sure that you're just kind of harvesting those throughout the summer and then preserving them in a manner that you can then use them in the casserole. So uh, blanching them and freezing them is going to be ideal. So you want to make sure that you've got enough um, plants that you're going to be growing to help produce that amount that you're going to be needing to eat every week. So I hope that makes sense. So Let's say, um, I don't want to use onions as an example because we eat so many onions, I just don't have the space to grow them. Um, But let's say that, you know, you use one onion every day 
in your cooking for your family of four. So you would need to do a little bit of math, right? And work out, you know, how many onions that is um, for the year. So if it was one onion every day, that would be seven times 52 because there's 52 weeks in a year, which brings us to the magic number of 364. So we're going to need at least 364 onion plants to see us through the year. Now, of course, you'd need to grow a few more to account for, you know, losses from pests or disease. But you can see that's that's a lot of onions and most um, home gardeners do not have that amount of space um, to account for, you know, that amount of onions. But you could look at something um, that is very similar to onions, for example, um, if you really like to, to grow and, and use um, onions. You could use uh, grow leeks, for example, which take up a lot less space than onions, and you might be able to grow a good portion of that fruit and veg that you're looking um, at, you know, reducing your reliance on the grocery store for example but don't be disheartened if you're going through this exercise and you realize that you know like like onions for example you know there's just too many of them that you're using um in a year to be able to kind of grow them successfully because i'm pretty sure um that most of you listening to this are not going to want to dedicate like your entire backyard to growing just one crop you're going to want to grow a variety variety um, to kind of, you know, create your own meals from scratch out of the garden and, uh, you know, be a bit more um, self-reliant and away from the grocery store. So it's a really good exercise, though, to go through and just kind of figure out how much is it that you're, you know, really using and how many um, people are in your family and then just kind of doing the math on how much each person is eats and if you're kind of a little bit like stuck on well where do I start for this um I do have a free guide and it's my how much to plant free guide um where I've kind of worked out um how much to plant per person on a number of different vegetables now of course you can um adjust that to your own personal tastes right um you know my family will eat way more Brussels sprouts than I ever will um so you know if you've got people in your family who you know don't eat certain vegetables or you know you kind of force them to eat them instead um you know and they're gonna have less then you know you can plant less for that that's a good starting point for you to kind of figure out what plants are you going to want to grow but also um how many you're going to need and what's really feasible for your garden because i know so many gardeners um you know our ultimate goal is always to well i just want to grow my own food i want to be able to grow it all and you know not rely on the grocery store at all like that that is a great goal to have and um we need to be realistic if we've got a really small backyard and we've only got, you know, a couple of, um, you know, five by two beds, um, we're not going to be able to grow everything to be totally self-sufficient, but we are able to grow some things and we can, you know, even include what we're going to be canning throughout the season as well. So, um, I try to be self-sufficient in tomato sauce and canned tomatoes that we have um, on our property. So I will grow um, probably about 12 to 18 plants of tomatoes each year. And that's that's quite a lot. Um, <laughs> probably some of you guys thinking, oh my gosh, I don't even know where I'm going to put one tomato plant, let alone 12 or 18. Um, and, and a lot of that is because we account for how much we're going to need to make sauce. So I know that, you know, if I've got 12 Amish paste tomato varieties, um, for example, that's going to see us through more than enough um, tomato sauce, salsa, can you know can crush tomatoes all that sort of stuff for the whole year for four people i like to add extra tomato varieties so i've got slicing varieties cherry tomatoes you know things like that that we can snack on and enjoy fresh whereas my paste tomatoes are all for the the canner 
right? Um, you know, I don't really get to enjoy those fresh. They're all for preserving. So think about what it is some of your goals are going to be and trying to plan around um, what it is that you're going to be growing based on some of those goals. And, you know, don't don't feel um, bad and don't beat yourself up about it if, you know, you're not able to um, attain some of these goals right now right? Um, it's it's a journey with gardening and you're going to be learning skills that are going to help you get there each year. Like each year you grow something, you're going to get a little bit better at it. And each year that you grow a garden, something weird and wonderful will happen in that garden. And as long as you keep persevering, you will hone your skills and you will get better and you'll be able to come up with these really creative and ingenious ways to grow more out of the space that you have. I see it over and over and over again with new gardeners who are starting their garden and then, you know, when things are starting to go well, you know, and they're bitten by the gardening bug, like their creativity goes crazy. And, you know, I've seen, you know, gardeners growing vegetables in old Wellington boots, like old rubber boots, <laughs> you know, things, things get really creative and that's wonderful to see. And, you know, if you live near a community garden and you're looking for inspiration, you know, take a look if you can during the summer when people are growing, um, fruits and veggies to kind of get some great ideas on, you know, how people can grow. And you can definitely leverage some of those into your own garden. Like when I had an allotment, like people's creativity plot to plot was always amazing to see and people were really maximizing the amount that they could get out of those garden spaces on the allotment and you know people had different goals there was you know my plot neighbors um were very much into you know using their pesticides um you know they only grew um hybrid varieties you know, they didn't really deviate from, from those things, but there was a, a plot, um, at the other end of the allotment, for example, and they were building this beautiful, like willow woven, um, like windbreaker. And they had this, um, woven willow, like TP, like a little like kind of living house thing that they they'd made in there rather than like a, a normal garden shed it was like a, a little bench in there that they could sit down and relax and kind of you know get out of the sun so you know your your garden goals are very different from you know your neighbors and from other other gardeners so write down what your goal is going to be for your garden what vegetables and fruits that you're regularly buying or that you regularly eat and then try and figure out how much of it you're actually eating on a regular basis and how much your family are you know eating on a regular basis and then do some math on how much um that is actually going to need for you to to be able to grow and then you can start to plan on how many plants that's going to need and what you can actually put into the garden space that you have. Now let's talk a little bit about where to get your seeds from because there's lots and lots and lots of seed companies that are out there. There's so many and there's probably ones that are local to where you live and you know now we're in a, a great technological age where we can just do a quick search engine of you know seed companies near me or seed companies in the state that you live in. For example you could look up I don't know seed companies in Alaska, um, seed companies in um, Michigan, seed companies in Georgia you know you can look up all this information and you find companies that are near you and I found local seed companies through some um, different kind of means so I found local seed companies through um, the uh, the exchange which is run by seed savers exchange um, that was a great resource of um, local kind of seed companies or you know small um you know, seed savers who were starting a company, that was a, a good resource for that. Um, but also looking up different um, organizations as well. So Aussie, so the Open Source Seed Initiative, um, they have a list of lots of different um, seed suppliers on there who are um, 
working with um, or run by plant breeders that are working on um, some really cool um projects and uh, increasing the um, genetic diversity of the seeds that we have available to us to grow um, and I will make sure to link up to um, the Aussie um, list of, of seed companies because it's not just seed companies here in the US it's seed companies in Canada um, the UK and I think they even had Australia on there as well and I would encourage you to check out like local suppliers first um, because the plants that they're growing and the seed that you're going to be able to get if they're growing it um, locally is going to be a lot more um, adapted to your growing conditions and that's going to mean a better garden for you um, by doing that. Now if there isn't a local seed company nearby then you could look at one that has um, or ones that are growing or providing seed that are in a similar region for you so for example maybe you're looking in the southwest area Area. maybe you're looking um, places that are at high altitude um, like I am maybe you're looking at things that are growing in hot and humid areas because you know you're out there in Florida or um, Alabama or you know down in Houston in Texas you know that you've got different very different climatic conditions and um, although seeds adapt and they you know you get many seed varieties that will grow in different climates um, having seeds that are grown locally they're a lot more used to the weather conditions that you have and you're going to be able to you know get your garden up and going a lot quicker because you know they're already kind of used to those conditions but I definitely think it is worth looking at lots of different seed companies, especially before um, you settle on and, and buy seed. And I find that I I buy from several different companies. I will buy from companies that are in the Pacific Northwest because they carry varieties that I loved and miss from England. So I will purchase those varieties from them. But then I will also get seeds from, you know, places that are out in the Midwest or places that are, you know, from the, the Northeast because I have different uh, varieties that are available. They're able to cope with colder temperatures um, from the Northeast, which is um, sometimes a, a bonus because living at an altitude, um, you can get some really weird and wonderful things happen with the weather. So I will often look across different companies to look at different varieties that they have available. And sometimes, um, you know, your wallet will do the decision on which one that you're going to buy, right? Um, we've all been there, had to buy the cheapest. But sometimes we um, get the catalogs together or I'll pull up the web pages if I'm looking online and I will have my family come and take a look at the different varieties that I'm looking at and I'll usually try and narrow it down to three different varieties that um, I would like to grow in the garden so I don't know let's take cabbages for example right I've got three different types of, of cabbage and I will have my family come and take a look at it and I will let them choose like which which one that they they want to grow and it has to be a unanimous decision on um which which one that they want and sometimes you know we'll, we'll ask those questions well why why do you want that one and it might be just uh, the shape of it or the color of it um, is what's really driving that decision. But sometimes, even though my family aren't really into gardening, it might be um, something about like the average yield, for example, or the size of um, that plant, or um, maybe it's got some like cool um, disease resistance or something like that, you know, that's actually um, the driver. And the more that I involve, um, my family with the decision making process on what the seeds are that we're going to grow the more involved and engaged they become when it comes to you know harvesting out of the garden and even eating the vegetables too so you know if you've got kids that are you know picky eaters for example um getting them involved with like hey what are we going to grow in the garden and um you know giving them the opportunity to not only help you grow it and help you harvest it and maybe help you cook it and you know them eating it as well um you might find that they 
they actually, um, you know, do make it through that whole portion of uh, green beans or broccoli or whatever it is that, um, you know, they help to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was certainly one of the, the tricks I think that my family used to get us to eat more veggies and stuff as kids was we, we helped with harvesting it out of the garden and then, you know, it was fresh and we were eating it in the kitchen, you know, a couple of minutes later. So definitely take a look at different sources for your seeds and, you know, you might have, um, other requirements, like maybe you're wanting all organic seeds or, Maybe you're wanting an all heirloom garden or, you know, whatever, you know, it is that you're looking for. There's seed companies that are going to be able to cater to that. And that's that's the great thing about, um, you know, having that availability digitally and being able to, you know, look that up online and try and find those seeds and those companies um, available um, it, it's a really uh, neat tool to be able to be using. We're not kind of having to rely on, you know, looking in, you know, a paper or a magazine and then writing off and, you know, getting something in the mail. Um, you know, it's it's not limited to, you know, a a couple of seed companies anymore. There's, there's so many more smaller companies um, and they often have a larger variety um, of different, you know, fruits, vegetables and herbs available. Um, because they're so much smaller they, they've got a lot more diversity in there which is always great to see because you can try something new um, something new something exciting and it might be the new rock star vegetable for your garden so that's it for this week. I hope you found this episode helpful and I hope to see how your list is starting and how you're getting on with it. Um, come on over to the Facebook group. The link is in the description to the podcast and share, show me what you're planning on growing and show me how much you're planning on growing in your garden next year. Until next week, I hope your garden grows beautifully and I'll see you then.